And now I would like to introduce Dr. Michael Zena. He's a neuroradiologist at Stanford, and clinically he supports advanced imaging at Stanford. He does research in neurodegenerative disorders, and in particular is interested in sports-related mild traumatic brain injury. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the podium. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this uh, this wonderful symposium. So, um, as we know from all the wonderful talks so far, let's see if this is work, that um, concussion is obviously important, but it's not limited to concussion, as we heard about. It's hard to pinpoint what concussion is sometimes, um, but it's particularly important in sports. And one of the questions come up, is there some kind of objective test? Even something more directly we can try and answer is what happens in the brain that underlies all the symptoms of concussion. And one of the wonderful things is uh, technology, in particular of MRI, has advanced in the past 30 years that we can make observations of, uh, of athletes and even that we know these athletes are going to get exposed to concussion so we can make observations to them before and after they have their events. So it can be a very unique source of data that can help us understand neuroscientifically what's going on in underlying concussion. So the, the point I want to get at is can we get at brain changes that underlie concussion and how can this help us out? And um, this is a long process, obviously. It's an entire field, almost several fields of uh, study to understand what's going on in the brain in um, uh, mild traumatic brain injury. I'm just going to briefly summarize some of the findings in the literature. So, um, uh, we, um, in terms of the way the brain is organized, the cortex is on the outside. That's where all kind of the um, CPU, so to speak, or microprocessors, all the neurons tend to live. And it's normal over aging for the cortex to thin. It's a normal expected process. But when people have analyzed people who had expo uh, exposure to high impact sports like football and hockey, their cortex is thinner at a later, you know, uh, um, at a later age, 50s to 70s, compared to cohorts, suggesting that there may be some evidence possibly of neurodegeneration attributable to sports. And particularly, this is noticeable when people, when these uh, athletes are symptomatic. So the cortex is on the outside, on, on the inside, and, and then here, let me, the cortex is all this gray stuff on the outside. Um, just under that is all this white stuff called the white matter. That's all the cabling of the brain. And so the cortex is connected from one side of the hemisphere to the other, oops, sorry, from one side to the other, or uh, different parts via this white matter or cabling. And uh, Dr. Harris mentioned this technique called diffusion tensor imaging, which lets you measure uh, roughly speaking, the integrity of these uh, white matter pathways. And it's thought that these white matter pathways undergo injury in all forms of uh, traumatic, or many forms of traumatic brain injury. And some similar studies on retired players have shown differences in measures of integrity in these structures. Um, and some much more recent data, in particular looking at tau, which is of interest in chronic traumatic encephalopathy, we'll look at later, suggesting that former players versus controls do have elevations in tau. And uh, part of the point I want to make in showing this is that um, while they do see differences, this is one of the challenges of going, looking at titles of talks saying, oh, well, tau is different between this group and that group, is the difference between group differences and individual differences. So here you see that, um, you know, this group on average is higher than controls. But if you look at an individual player, you have no idea if that person has uh, uh, had an exposure to football or not just based on that. So it's something to take worth a grain of salt in terms of the way the neuroscience of this works. We do one study, we find something, but we need more studies and different kinds of studies to converge on evidence. And it, it is a major step to go from this to something that's useful in an individual athlete. Um, so that's over the longest time period possible after decades of possible uh, exposure to these sports. What is seen over shorter time periods, say, in actively playing athletes? Some have found, but this has been less universally found, that the cortex is getting thinner at the college level. Um, and more evidence is uh, converging on a part of the brain called hippocampus. Hippocampus is a part of the brain that's really important in memory. Uh, and learning and, uh, and remembering things. It's part of the brain that is 
severely affected in Alzheimer's disease, which is why Alzheimer's patients have a lot of difficulty with memory, and it's affected in CTE as well. Um, and some, uh, this is cross-sectional data. What I mean by cross-sectional data is they take like 30 football players, 30 athletes who aren't football players, and 30 controls, and scan their brains and see what they see. So that's a good first step to see if there's potentially some signal there, but there are potentially many confounders as well. People may be developmentally different, they may have very different exposures, and so some of the data, our data I'm gonna present is longitudinal data, where we have multiple data points in each person, which can attempt to control for differences at baseline. Nevertheless, this has showed some compelling uh, potential differences in size with wider separation between groups and the size of the hippocampus and people on high compared to low impact sports. So it's suggesting there's something worth looking for in there. Um, similarly, people have seen changes in white matter using diffusion, tensor imaging to look at white matter integrity. And it's across a variety of sports. Here they looked at boxers and mixed martial arts. The, the hardest time period to image and, and decipher what's going on in the brain is right after a concussion. Um, people have done diffusion tensor imaging to look at changes in white matter connectivity. But in the acute period, you actually see an opposite effect than you see in the chronic period. In the chronic period, you tend to see a reduction in this thing called fractional anisotropy, which is a measure of how water um, diffuses in white matter. Um, acutely, some people have found that this increases and then maybe it decreases. I'm going to also show some of our own data reflective of that. So um, some of what we're trying to do here at Stanford is, A, we want to deal with the fact that, you know, everybody's different. So to track people over time to look at dynamic changes. Um, the data I'm presenting to you, we're looking at football and volleyball players, but now we're expanding to more sports and, and additionally including females. Um, we're trying to use advanced quantitative imaging, use DTI to look at white matter. Also, I'll look at brain perfusion. I'm not going to show any results on that, but it's a way to measure particularly what may be happening after a concussion. And most interest, also very interestingly, is to correlate with biophysical measures of trauma. And I'll show that some of that in my uh, second talk. So this is a paper that, um, so I'm going to present now results from two papers. This one just got accepted. And this one, we specifically wanted to look at the hippocampus. Again, because um, it's a very important part of the brain for memory, and certainly um, one of the potential complaints from in post-concussive syndrome is memory complaints, and as well as long-term complaints um, related to CTE can include um, memory problems. So we looked at the hippocampus, and in particular we want to do longitudinal imaging, not just cross-sectional imaging. That way we can uh, do our best to account for differences in just normal anatomy. Um, I'm going to go kind of fast and basically summarize that we scan 60 football players and 30 volleyball, volleyball players. And um, when you do these kind of studies, some subjects go away because they have incidental things going on. But our final analysis included about 60 and um, oops, about um, 60 football and 30 volleyball players. So uh, this is a image of the brain. This is what's called a coronal image. It's like if I took an image like this and section through, and, um, and uh, th this white stuff here is your cerebral spinal fluid. It's normal fluid that bathes the brain. Um, here's the cortex over here. This is one hemisphere. That's another hemisphere. The hemispheres are split in half. This is the corpus callosum, which is the white matter tract that connects, one of the major white matter tracts that connect the two hemispheres. This is all the hemispheric white matter. Some of these fibers connect to the left to the right analogous areas. Some connect from here down to the brain stem, down to the spinal cord. Here's a little tidbit of cerebellum. I, I love anatomy. I can go on about this endlessly. <laughs> um, so here is the temporal lobe. Here is this mid portion of the temporal called the medial temporal lobe. And here is the hippocampus. And it turns out from a lot of different kinds of studies, um, we can separate the hippocampus into little different parts, and this is relevant because the different parts have different circuitry and different susceptibility to diseases. And so uh, computer algorithms have gotten more sophisticated, so we can actually automatically, I'm sorry, we can actually automatically take an image like this and split it apart into these component parts. And here you can see a 3D rendering of the hippocampus and its so-called subfields. And I don't want to put people to sleep going about statistics, but um, 
W one of the challenges doing these kinds of studies, is even though we wanted to have as matched cohorts as possible, uh, we scanned people at the different beginnings of their seasons. Well, their seasons started at different times, so their ages were a little different. Um, you know, obviously there's more concussions in football players compared to volleyball players you know, in the past, as well as during the study. Um, and ethnicities are hard to balance. But in the study, we statistically tried to account for and successfully accounted for all these factors. I'm just going to graphically show one of, our, uh, one of our major results. So just looking at baseline, we have this data. We just did a cross-sectional analysis. At baseline, are there hippocampi different? Can we replicate what's been shown in literature? And we did find a difference. That is, football players, on average, had a smaller hippocampus. Uh, in particular, there's one part of the hippocampus called subiculum compared to volleyball players. You can see this is not a perfect separation. You take any random red dot there, you can't tell which sport it comes from. But when you collapse the data together, on average, football is smaller than volleyball. It's still harder to know what that means, um, but that's why we have more data here. One other interesting analysis we did just within football is we looked at the different positions. Uh, the players were playing. Because there's pretty good data on, depending on your position, what your risk is of having concussion, um, largely from NFL data. And we found that in the same region that was different between football and volleyball, in the subiculum, uh, we found that players, come on, players who were in a high concussion risk position tended to have smaller subiculum volumes than those at a lower concussion risk position. So again, um, indirect, but still lending support the idea that maybe the volume of the subiculum can be affected by this high exposure impact. Um, the most compelling analysis we did was this longitudinal analysis where we try and account for where people are at baseline and what direction they're going. And we found within the hippocampus in a slightly different region that um, volleyball players had their um, had their CA1, which is a portion of the hippocampus, volume increasing, whereas football players had their volumes decreasing. And there, there were error bars here. They, 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 I don't know why they didn't come out on the slide. Here you can see the error bar is better. So you can see here that um, volleyball on average is increasing, whereas football is on average decreasing. What's also compelling is that this is even different from zero. So even apart from volleyball, the football volumes of the hippocampus are decreasing over time. Really interesting, this effect was um, about one quarter of our players, football players in the study, had concussions. And this effect was strongest in the, those who didn't have concussion, um, suggesting this may be subconcussive or undetected concussion impacts. Um, it's not clear why we didn't see it in concussion, but that was a smaller cohort, so maybe we had less statistical power. Um, What's kind of interesting, somewhat nuanced in this, is that we found different effects in different parts of the hippocampus. And the circuitry of the hippocampus is pretty well known. And we found our longitudinal effects in this part called CA1. And the, uh, the baseline effects were in this downstream region called the subiculum. And so it might be that, you know, this is very speculative, but effects may happen more uh, longitudinally and the more upstream circuitry and then end up affecting more downstream circuitry chronically, but that's a very speculative interpretation. Um, these kind of studies, it's important to acknowledge limitations. We're seeing small changes. Um, we've only looked at males. Uh, we didn't find significant correlations with uh, neurobehavioral measures. Um, and it's still hard to define causality in this. It may be the volleyball players studied a lot more and the football players were sleeping in. Uh, you know, there's, um, but there, this is certainly a significant step towards getting more compelling data about um, involvement of the hippocampus that may be related to these high impacts. Um, so um, I'm now I'm going to talk about a second study uh, that we've been involved in. And in this one, um, <clears throat> we wanted to focus in on the white matter, in particular the corpus callosum. So here's a rendering. You can see the callosum, and it's this white matter tract. It's the biggest um, pathway that connects the left and right hemispheres in the brain. And it's known to be involved, in particular in moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. So what we wanted to do in this is we had a smaller cohort of football players who had, wore this thing called a mouth guard. And so this is um, made by a lab of David Camarillo, who was unable to be here today. Um, but they, uh, what they do is all football players generally wear mouth guards to protect their, you know, 
teeth, to tongue, etc. Um, these mouth guards are equipped with accelerometers, and these measure um, acceleration. So when the football player gets hit, it'll record out of these accelerometers. Um, and by combining this accelerometry information with finite element models of the brain, you can make, ma make maps of stretching that occurs in the brain, or so-called strain and strain rate. And you can do this in different modeled brain structures. And when we did this, um, in particular when David's lab did this, they found that um, two cases that we had, come on, two cases that we had, uh, one which had an alteration of consciousness, consciousness concussion, the other had a self-report concussion. They had elevated strain rates in particular in the, um, I'm sorry, elevated, yeah, strain rate in the corpus callosum. And we had DTI in these same players. And we looked in these uh, players' alteration of consciousness had a chronically depressed um, DTI measure, fractional anisotropy. And the player who had alteration of consciousness um, acutely had an elevation in their fractional anisotropy. And on follow-up, it was depressed. So again, some evidence suggesting that these DTI measures can be very complicated to understand, but there may be acute changes that result in chronic changes which are in the opposite direction. So um, what's most compelling about this study is that it involves two completely different data sources, one looking at acceleration of the head and the other look at imaging. And it, I think it's a very powerful way to begin to scientifically interrogate what's happening, um, what's happening in sports that may contribute to brain injury. So this is data we have and we're continuing to analyze our data. We have ongoing data collection. We're acquiring, uh, acquiring data from both genders. Uh, so we're acquiring uh, data in lacrosse, uh, women's lacrosse here at Stanford. We're getting more sports. Uh, we're also more institutions. We're collaborating with USC to get a multi-institutional uh, approach and specifically looking at concussive and subconcussive injury. And hopefully combining all this together, we can understand to what extent is the hippocampus involved in subconcussive injury and to what extent the callosum is involved in acute, concussive, and potentially subconcussive injury. And I think I've ended early, so a, a huge team to get all this stuff done. But uh, I want to thank them, and I thank you all very much.